Hi, today our guest will be Mark Reinhagen, roleplay, card, video, and board game designer. Hi, Mike, M Mark. Um, it's nice to have you here. Well, thanks for having um, me. I know this is not your first Perkin Festival. I know you were here two years ago. Yeah. And how do you like it today? Do you feel any difference as compared to the previous oh edition? Oh my gosh, this is amazing. This convention, first of all, this wasn't here last time. Like, this is awesome. Like, the, the, the convention feels like it's just evolving and growing so quickly and maturing also. Like, it, uh, it was just a bit more rougher on the edges now. Everything is just so much more developed and technological and, and uh, media savvy. And uh, I don't know, it's really, really cool. It's such a big convention. It's but nice then to, to hear see that. it so well run in the VIP room, choice, <laughs> choice. Nice to hear that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I love PureCon. I really uh, do. You're a guest of honor here, and considering your um, body of work, your great impact on the um, game world, you're a living legend, right? So. Um, My wife doesn't say so. <laughs> oh, women, you know. <laughs> um, actually, tell us how did it all start? When was this uh, landmark, this special moment when you actually say to yourself that um, this is the way of your living, game design? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I always as a kid, I was always obsessed with games. And, uh, you know, I came up a long, long time ago in the 70s is when I started gaming. So uh, Dungeons and Dragons had just come out. But even before Dungeons and Dragons came out, I was already doing war games with my dad. So these old fashioned hexagon war games with stacks of cardboard counters. I mean, I was playing these really complex games at like age eight or nine, I guess. Whoa, so that's I, amazing. I, and, you know, and I, my dad taught me to play chess when I was five or six. So, I mean, I was really just obsessed with games from the very beginning, games and puzzles. Uh, and uh, I guess it was because I, I couldn't read until I was in fourth grade. I had ADD and dyslexia, and so uh, I couldn't read at all. Uh, and so games were like a, a way for me to just sort of sit there and study the chessboard for hours. And my dad would come back and make his move, and I, and I was just determined to beat him. I was <laughs> hyper competitive. Did you cheat? <laughs> Some, no, 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 no. I never cheat. Because the cheating, you just you're not actually winning. Then are you? Yeah, of course. You, you never feel good if you cheat on a game. What's I don't understand why people cheat on games. That's so stupid. <laughs> so um, I was just obsessive about games, you know. And it's funny now because uh, uh, now, like a lot of game designers, I'm absolutely not competitive. Like I never play a game to win anymore. I still love games. But that competitiveness I had when I was a kid with board games, I just don't have that. I, I play to have fun and for everyone else to have fun. And if I can sneak in a win, I will, you know, but it's mm -hmm. not my goal. And being so involved in this field, the game industry, um, don't you feel sometimes a bit tired of our hobby of games that actually became your work? Yeah, a lot of people, you know, that's a problem that, like for a lot of filmmakers is that, you know, they're, they love movies and then you start making films and then you start seeing every film as oh i know that place i know where that was filmed you know and that happened to me with my tv show like i know all these locations in la because we shot there for the vampire show but for gaming i don't know for some reason i just love games so much that i just never even even though i know how everything works mechanically underneath i know the it just is not ruined for me it's addictive yeah yeah <laughs> whereas whereas some tv shows if they're not that good they're kind of a bit ruined like oh we shot there and my kids are now like you absolutely dad cannot talk during that show <laughs> anymore uh you mentioned uh, filmmakers and you mentioned your tv show i know that um in 1996 you were also a part of a screenwriting team of the tv show for fox tv yeah uh, kindred yeah. the embraced right yeah, yeah um and you said let me quote that it was the goal of my life but finally i just left why and if you were to make it again would you like to uh, try again screenwriting? Uh, actually, I'm working on being a novelist now because I think it's a better path. Yeah, my life goal was always to be a screenwriter and director. I want to be a hyphenate, like both write my own movies. And I got to Hollywood and I just got there and I realized after being betrayed like six times in a row that it's a ruthless business and I was way too nice a guy mm -hmm. to survive there. And now, nice guys sometimes succeed. Like, like Spielberg was able, he's a, he's a really good person, and he somehow got in 
with the right thing and, and, and got lucky, you know? And plus, he's just mega, mega talented, <laughs> right? And I was not as talented in screenwriting or directing as he was, and I did with Get Lucky. And so I just was ground up. And so I spent like four years in Hollywood pitching stuff, and I, I'm, I'm legally obliged to not mention the movies that I believe are stolen from me, and I sued them over. <laughs> but yeah, there's a number of situations where I just ended up in, in court. And, you know, oh and, and, and it's just like uh, this having my idea stolen again and again like that. I, I just was like, screw this. You know, I'm going to go to Burning Man. That's reasonable, actually. And, you know, the road to success and you are here, right? Yeah. With us. Yeah. And um, in your opinion, um, what is the most important element um, difference, the most important difference between screenwriting and game writing? <sighs> um. What is difficult? Screenwriting is intensely. Uh, role playing is is verbal, mm -hmm. right? You create a scene by talking out the words of a character. If you have a plot change in a movie that's based on a character's words, the scene will fall flat. the The key moment of a scene, the dramatic moment, must be expressed in a visual way. So, if Cersei says, "You know, mm -hmm. to the gallows with you," you need a shot that someone captures this gallows thing. Whereas a role playing. You know, you don't want to say, and they guards just take you to the gallows. No, you want a character to say, and give this glorious speech with the gallows. And it's dramatic that way because role playing is a, is, a, is a medium that is evoked just like a podcast through the voice and through characters and Making sound. decisions, right? Yeah, but movies yeah. and TV is expressly visual. And a lot of movies and TV shows fail because they don't have a plot point or a twist or a key thing, it, you know, express through a visual moment that you know a lot of screenwriters think it's all about the dialogue well dialogue is wonderful but you don't have key moments happen through dialogue you lead up to the that moment with dialogue but then it has to be a visual transition somehow and so that that's the difference do you have in your free time um do you play role play games just for fun Yeah, actually, um, some, How often? I live in, not that often because I live in Tbilisi. There's not that many role players. But recently, um, some kids, uh, young teenagers in Tbilisi, where I live in Republic mm -hmm. of Georgia, wrote to me on Facebook and said, uh, we steal all our games on Pirate Bay, but we just downloaded Ars Magica. Are you the Mark Ryan Hagen who wrote it? I go, Yeah. Would you play with us? And I was like, what? And so I did. We played an Ars Magica game. With game the, Master with Uncle. And Great by the thing. way, it was so weird because their parents are younger than me. And they're like, <laughs> what is this old guy coming to our house with our kids? And I was so embarrassed. But it's Georgia. And so I just had my wife talk to them and they were totally cool. And it was just quite a wonderful experience. So and nice, I had a great time. Nice favorite uncle, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's, how, that's how I felt. I was like the weird uncle who's just having fun with the kids, you know? Uh, speaking of Georgia, uh, because this is very interesting for me for me personally, because I was a part of uh, of the team, game design th team that was making Sniper Ghost Warrior 3 yeah. that is taking place in Georgia. In really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, why Georgia? I know that you also became a political figure there. Isn't right? I wouldn't say political figure, <laughs> and, and I have to be careful here because I'm, okay. I'm not allowed to really comment on the okay. politics of the region. Just for my safety and the safety of sure. my family, but uh, yeah, I was I, I used to do stuff in the region with politics and consulting, and now I try to move back to gaming again, just because uh, in that region of the world, being too involved in politics is just not safe. So uh, I'm sort of moving back from that, a, 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 at least publicly. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> joking. I really am moving it back in the games very strongly again. You know, that's my. Uh, it's fun for me, like games is, uh, but you know, back in the novel writing, uh, you know, and, and games. And uh, actually, you are especially interested in uh, the folklore or, you know, legends like Armazi, the mountain ghost or something? Yeah, I'm obsessed with mythology, <laughs> wow. legends. Yeah, that's my, I would say that uh, when I found out that Star Wars was based on Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, yep. uh, I basically forced my dad to buy me all of Joseph Campbell's books. And once I started reading about the mythology of the world, I was just absolutely obsessed. And I think I have a pretty good knowledge of the, you know, and I think what people misunderstand about mythology is they think, oh, it's these really weird old stories. And they don't realize that they were the comic books of the time. 
like these were like the stories that th this is their Hollywood, mm -hmm. right? These stories of these cultures, that was the storytelling that held their culture together. It's powerful stuff. And if you want to be a storyteller, and I do, I mean, I, I, I'm much more of a storyteller than I am a game designer. Like what I do is I help people tell stories and all my games are about stories, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that's what I'm obsessed with. I, 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 that's why I wanted to go to Hollywood. I wanted, I wanted to be a storyteller in the biggest way I could possibly be. And, uh, and, and what I found out is I really love helping other people be storytellers. And I think there's a, a beautiful thing when people are telling their own stories, when people themselves are expressing their own lives through stories, when they're being a storyteller. It's just a powerful, beautiful thing. People become much wiser when they're storytellers, they're wiser people. And uh, not always, there are a lot of gamers who are pretty unwise, but, but generally a lot of gamers I think are, are quite wise, or much wiser than they would be otherwise that, from having uh, told their own stories. <laughs> I totally agree with you, totally. And if you, because you were here, uh, you were running your sessions uh, two years ago at Percon Festival, and um, you played also with Polish, uh, Polish gamers and uh, RPG users. Um, how are they? How is their style? Do you like it? Like they, they are storytellers or you know, more, you know, Polish mechanical gamers focused? remind me of the early days of my life going to game conventions like like nowadays in america everyone's kind of cynical and they have their little crowds and oh i'm a cost player oh i'm a D, &D player everyone's got their little groups and everything and everyone at PureCon is so it's like i was just in the beer hall and someone <laughs> dropped a cup and everyone stood up and started applauding and they're so <laughs> exuberant so happy and such a collective feeling of warmth that i was like wow this brings me back to the good days and I think that's a really beautiful thing that everyone is so happy to be here and happy to be involved and happy to have maybe this refuge from life. This is this place where you can let your freak flag fly, baby. And, and everyone feels connected to each other. That's that's worth its price in gold. They share their hobby, right? Yeah. And they, they love it, actually. Yeah, and yeah. whereas in America, I think people, people feel... You know, they're divided by their hobby. They have their own little cans within the hobby, and everyone's like, oh, no, I don't do that. I do this. Whereas here, no matter what you're into, everyone seems to be very much... Even though it's 40, what, 50,000 people this year, maybe? 50,000 people, and they all have a, a, it's common, growing bigger, right? a common sense. It's a huge convention. Yeah. This is a really, really yeah. large convention. And yet everyone feels this unity, which you don't see at a big conventions ever, usually. You know, it's great. It's good to hear once again, because uh, actually every year we're growing um, bigger and bigger. Um, I wonder how it would be this year. And um, speaking of those lots, lots of fans, many, many people, RPG users, um, what are your biggest, biggest, greatest um, hopes and fears considering uh, the role-play game market worldwide, the future of well, role-play I mean, games? Obviously, the big fear is, is that as computer games get more and more immersive, yeah. and, you know, and I've done a VR game, uh, uh, that, that, that basically that is virtual reality and you know, gets more and more integral, or more, more, more scary, augmented reality gets to the point where basically then uh, will lose that sense of you creating your own story because why would you want to tell your own story when you can just put in these goggles and you're in a vampire world that really exists and oh, there's a vampire right there. Oh my God, it's a vampire, <laughs> right? And, and that, you know, that's totally immersive, but it's someone else's story. So as a game designer, as a storyteller, yeah, I want to tell stories and I want a million people to hear my story. But as a role player, I think it's beautiful that people tell their own stories. You know, that they're taking my world and, or, or anyone's world and rules and make it their own. So what I hope happens with augmented reality games, which I think are going to be much bigger than virtual reality, that as they go on, that will still be this interaction between the creators of the games and the players, and the players themselves will be creators somehow. That they'll be involved in that somehow. And that, I think it's so important to the ethos of role-playing. That, that everyone is a creator, everyone is creative. We're not just an audience sitting there passively, that we're involved. And if we lose that, I'll be very upset. And so I'm working as hard as I can to try and you know, educate computer game designers, hey man, mm -hmm. if you make 
the players involved in the process and let them create stuff. As like in Bloodlines, you can help you can create your own scenarios. This makes a much better game. And why why are these sub come games ever clear, ever green? Why are they always successful? It's often because the players are involved in the world. They can be creative. Yeah. People want to be creative. This is the big lesson of role playing. People want to be creative. They want to they want to play inside the they want to play in the world. Minecraft. Why yeah. is Minecraft? Because yeah. they get to play. They get to create stuff. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, a lot of gamers don't have that, a lot of creative people have this sort of arrogance, let's say. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult <laughs> anyone, but uh, that we are better storytellers. Mm-hmm. And we are, maybe. We are professional storytellers. But, you know, that doesn't mean that people can't tell stories. And they want to tell stories. We should help them tell stories. We shouldn't just steal it all for ourselves and say, I'm the storyteller. You will listen to my story and only my story, you know? Because, yeah, so you made a step into game video, and I wanted to ask you actually about this difference between uh, creating a role play game where we, the players, are creating our histories, the game master is creating our own, uh, his own history, and video game is something that actually is up to creators, and um, I think much less in the hands of, of the players, right? And what, in your opinion, is the main difference while creating video game and role play game? Uh, the user thing, the player that actually ha- ha- have their impact. Yeah, I mean, I mean, basically, you are so confined a computer game to what a player can do. Like you know, like you can't really have a wide open story mm-hmm. because then you'd have to create art and 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 sounds and text yeah. for all yeah. these different yeah. avenues. And it's just impossible. And you always hit this wall at some point. Even when you have an open world, and some of these open worlds today are just absolutely amazing. You know, they're still limited. Whereas in a tabletop role-playing yeah. game, you're going to have someone say, you know what? Let's take a boat and sail west. The only limit actually is your imagination, yeah. right? So... And, and, so, and so that is just... And, and as a storyteller running a game, let's say as a game master, like you, don't, you can prepare, but you don't really know what's going to happen. And, it, and it's sometimes mind blowing. They'll take it in a completely different way, you know. And so, so that will always be the difference. Like no matter how advanced augmented reality games go or virtual reality games go, they're always be limited. Now there will be a point though where AI mm-hmm. will get so good that on the fly it will create all the. But a at matter that point, of time, I think. But at that <laughs> point, they're the masters, and <laughs> we're we're just the masses being entertained. And uh, I would love to see that. But I'm not sure I want to live there. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, I mean that's kind of scary. Yeah, kind and of. I, and I'm I'm all for AI. I mean, I'm not I'm not I'm not a Elon Musk saying, "Oh, they're going to eat us." You know, I'm for it, but I'm still a little little scared of an AI that could basically create any storytelling that I want based on my interaction. This is actually a very popular topic, right? And actually, I think this is a matter of time. Or when those uh, AI actually creators will be definitely better at what they are doing, and yeah. the AI will grow or will will grow in power, right? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, thirty years, we will certainly yeah. see an AI that will be able to create, you know, based on our interaction, be able to create a world almost seamlessly. Now, the problem is, I think that AI will still not be smart enough to actually creatively evoke stuff. But, 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 you know, certainly based on our input and our suggestions, it'll be able to create really cool stuff. That's it will be amazing. our story to tell to, yes, you know, yes. generations, following generations, right? Yep, yep. Mark, um, thank you very much for the interview. It You're was uh, very nice to meet you and to talk to you. Um, have a nice day and huh? enjoy Perkin. I, I always do. I love it here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.